What's this place? That's all I'm told. Not far from here, right down the road. Speak easy, seductive, sexy, sassy, sleazy. Not ghetto, there was women in stilettos that would lead you to the back as you follow rose petals. Players in suits, feeling great. Think I might even seen a pimp in a cave and wait. Who's that? Smoking the pipe. He said, My name is Rick. How's everybody doing tonight? Another question Do y'all like breasts? Oh, you do. Get ready for the less. Take a seat, feel the heat on a Saturday night. Each and every week, so you know I'll be there again. Cafe on American. Come on in, have a good time. We're good friends, sip good wine. Here's a few drink tickets to help you kick it. But shh. Speak easy, slide upstairs when you're tired of the club. Sprinkle up pimp dust, smoke a little bud. Get real close, maybe make a little love. Speak easy, ain't nothing open in my city after two with set for legs. I was feeling alright on a Saturday night and wasn't ready for bed. I had a friend with a grin and a friend with a band. See, they knew me at the door, so I slid right in. Hand nods and points, people pass the joint. Seen the freak with a booty juicy like an orange wood. And I'm Thursday, tonight I'm gonna party like it's my birthday. Guess what is yours? We gon' turn up the music and close the doors and keep the boat poor. No show with the flow show. Got the whole party like King Dro. You go, baby, coming in, feeling good, fresh from the hood. Got Joseph in the back like no, he did. Mm. But yes, I did. See, I seen it all when I was just a kid. And now I get to live it again. So don't stand outside, baby, come on in and have a good time. We're good friends, sip good wine. Here's a few drink tickets to help you kick it. With Slide upstairs when you're tired of the club. Sprinkle up pimp dust, smoke a little bud. Get real close, maybe make a little love. Speak easy. Armed. Solid red. There you go. There you yeah, go. here we go. Now we're recording with gas go kits oh We're recording with gas because there's no electricity <laughs> what a fucking day um i just went from the highs of having left my job and not having to be like ever stressed out or yelled at um by my boss again yeah, to owning your own life and the stress they're in oh uh, yeah to owning my own life and the stress they're in um so yeah there is no power at uh the house of hooks and nails right now and that's just what we're going to be dealing with yeah, I think we're going to deal with maybe a pause for D-Day to get situated, because, I don't know, he didn't even really take a break. But, um... So between last episode and now, I found... Wait, 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 wait. What? Uh, this is the Something Else, else This is the Something Else podcast. Oh, I'm yeah. D-Day, and you're Zeno. I'm Zeno, with an X, not a Z. The prefix, not the philosopher. Uh, this is the podcast where you talk about anything but that other thing. Um... In the desert, or <laughs> in the like desert. in places that aren't in the desert. Um, we're not talking about it if it's happening in Japan, which I hope it is, because I bet it's great, and their drugs are probably as designer as their mechs. Have you seen punk rockers from Japan? They put American punk rock to shame. Their um, rockabillies are more rockabilly. Their black people are more black people. It's amazing. Their appropriation is on fucking fleek. It's sorry that we don't say that. Yeah, no, you you point. say that. Um you and Rex can both be uh taking the kids lingo and using it as your own. Um yeah, the Japanese are like new age modding every single other sort of uh um of click. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, so this is the first episode that we're recording with this, but uh, somethingelsecast.com is live. Uh, somethingelsecast at gmail is where I want people to uh, send their homework assignments and give us some feedback or just spam us. I don't know. I click on pretty much everything. If you want to just um, send some malware to my machine, just oh, God, that's where be, you want to send it. That would be awesome. I've got a server if you guys want to infiltrate my I've server. I've got a server, too. It's just not actually accessible to the Internet right now. But if you compromise my machine that I use that with, it's on the same network. So you can, you know, if you're good, you can get to the server. That is X-E-N-O at X-E-N-O dot net. No, it's not. It is Q-E-O-X dot net. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, fine. I've definitely gotten malware from you. Yeah. Oh, no, it's only the best. Only the best malware. Um, so to set the scene... Well, this is... I want to do a quick check-in. Well, but we should say how we're recording. Okay. Um, we are recording on the Accuracy 3rd mobile kit in my backyard with 
no bistro lights above us because we have no power, um, and with a burning, uh, a burn barrel, burning chopped up pallet wood, um, surrounded by a couple of friends who have been helping with electrical work. Yeah, and there's uh, no servant serving us charcuterie and cheese throughout the podcast, which I'm a little pissed off about. We usually have a servant. It's it's usually pretty good craft services. Rex usually provides it, but not today. There is no power, and he is on strike. Yeah, so by the light of a strange little battery-powered lantern, we have a Red Bull and some beer, a little fire. Um, yeah. So, real quick, then apropos of nothing, uh, you know how... Uh, white nationalists have appropriated the OK symbol? Yes. Unfortunately, yes. Okay, so here's what I want to do. I want to appropriate Merry Christmas and say Merry... I thought you were going to go with thumbs up, but... No. Uh... <laughs> Merry Christmas means fuck fascism. But if you just... You have to, like, intone it a slightly differently. Like, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas and then, and is the new means, fuck fascist. And that means fuck fascism, fuck Trump, and fuck Republicans. And... If we get enough people doing it, then I don't know. It's kind of the same. Or it could be Merry. Then we can just say Merry Christmas with no compunction and say it loudly, like from rooftops, instead of being like Happy Holidays and Merry Christmas. You can say Merry Christmas, and that just means fuck you and your family. Or uh, Merry Xmas for Zeno. No. Oh, and who is wishing Zeno Merry Xmas? Who is that? Oh, I'm Daddy Issues. Hi. And uh, I wish you a a Merry Christmas, Daddy Issues. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> um, I also found... Uh, I'm not calling you a fascist. Okay, I'm just... I'm, I'm saying wondering. fuck fascists okay. at you. Okay. But um, don't like fuck oh, fascists. Fuck fascists don't you. don't fuck that's, conservatives. That's reply oh, with Merry, Merry Christmas Merry... to you too. Okay. Sir. All right. Or ma'am. Um, also, I found a podcast called the Zeno Podcast, which is uh, evidently a Mormon podcast from the Brigham Young... Uh, university <laughs> that has nothing to do with us whatsoever. Please go check them out. Uh, they sound fascinating. I but uh, when you're clicking on Patreon, uh, that's not us. Please do. Yeah, um, d- d- our Patreon, which is the something else cast. Patreon, yeah, and don't give to our people. Patreon, but definitely don't give to the Xeno Podcasts Patreon. Okay. Um, I'm from the town where Joseph Smith magically threw the magical golden tablets into the Susquehanna River. Um, I didn't know it was that far north. Yeah. Um, I knew it was like kind of New Englandy, but I didn't know it was like Just there. south from Susquehanna, Pennsylvania, just north of Halstead, Pennsylvania, mm-hmm. there's like a cemetery and, well, there's more shit now because they've started buying up Wait, all the towns. Wait, was that the cemetery that uh, Sarah and Jason took me to? Yes. Is that the same town? Yeah, 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 yeah. We Holy all went shit. there. Oh my God, we all went there. <laughs> um, remembering... Things with Zeno ah, from my early 20s. Ago. Um, that was like almost 20 years ago, dude. Mm-hmm. Um, I almost don't know anyone from 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's your shitty badge of honor. Oh, yeah. No, I'm a stain that you can't remove. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's Wear that badge proudly. <laughs> you're persistent, but like, it's become fine. The, I haven't had to ask dude, you to leave humans will for like acclimate a decade. to anything, including being friends with me. They'll be like, ah. After a couple of years, this is fine. I guess so, this is normal now. <laughs> just about 10, 12 years ago, um, on New Year's Eve, I had to ask Zeno to leave my house because he was screaming at me that I'm not punk rock anymore <laughs> because I wouldn't let him stab through the drywall of my apartment with like a $160 chef's knife that I have. <laughs> And I explained all of this to him. Aww. I remember it being uh, pretty checks calmly. Out. Checks out. Um, this was uh, like 2.30 to 4 in the morning um, after New Year's Eve, uh, New Year's Day. So I was probably wrecked as shit and not nearly as calm as I remember being. But I I do remember dealing with it with a measure of aplomb. I feel like I do take those directions to heart. Uh, while grumbling, I generally do... Um, do the thing I need to do when a friend of mine is like, uh, hey, you, you need to stop. Yeah, we don't do that anymore, but we used to. We used to live in shitholes. <laughs> right. Wait, have you seen my place? Ah, uh, not lately. I mean, oh, God, that carpet was terrible. Remember how disgusting that carpet was? Probably not. Nope. <laughs> 
Alright, well, so last episode we did music. I feel like it was both too long and too short. Um, there are a few things I kind of wanted to flesh out a little more, but we also wanted to keep it under an hour. And I kind of wanted to introduce the concept of having musical accompaniments to these things. Mm -hmm. So I set up a YouTube account under something else, and I'll be releasing a little uh, playlist for each uh, podcast that'll be an accompaniment. Fabulous. And if we get 100 subscribers, I'll let you slap me. It's never going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I didn't think it was going to happen for Accuracy 3rd. We got like 70 people in 15 minutes. Sure. Um, yeah, please don't subscribe to this. <laughs> I don't want to have to hit my friend. Daddy issues. You give a good slap? Mm -hmm. Oh, can I talk now? I'm talking to you. <laughs> I'm you not to. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, I've, I've uh, been told that I, I give some slaps. Great. Well, you'll get to see Daddy Issues and she'll slap me. And then again, mm. I will drink I uh, some that. Thanksgiving shots. Oh, yeah, the Thanksgiving shots. Mm. Yeah. They are savory and delicious. So last time we did music, um, and like we totally didn't get through everything we wanted to talk through, so I think we should have like sequels to the episodes we do, but like definitely not do it for at least a year, that's but fine. pick up right where we left off. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, no, but uh, the homework was to read the bit of the Futurist Manifesto regarding the art of noises. Mm -hmm. um, Which I uh, skimmed through the PDF today on mm -hmm. my last day of work. Yeah. Um, and realized no it was 46 it. pages and then well, did not read anymore. The the issue is that the, the Art of Noises is actually the first part of the whole manifesto. It's only like three pages. Oh, fabulous. Um, I am 100% planning on uh, writing an art manifesto mm -hmm. if uh, you want to write like three quarters of a page of it. Sure. Great. You're going to use like really big font? No, yeah, I am so going okay. to use circular okay. logic. You um, know what? If you're not going to let me bend the rules, then I'm out of this fucking game. All right. Fine. Um, here are the... I just wanted to touch on the art of noises a little bit. Mm. Oh, please. Um, here are the instruments that uh, they wanted to include in the 1913 Manifesto by Luigi Rosolo. Um, so there's classes of noises that are to be used in a performance. And this is back when they had like orchestras and shit. Mm -hmm. But uh, they wanted roars, thunderclaps, explosions, hissings, roars, bangs, and booms as one class. Right. The next is whistling, hissing, and puffing. The next one is whispers, murmurs, mumbling, mutters, and gurgling. Mm -hmm. The next one is screeching, creaking, rustling, humming, cracking, and rubbing. The next class is beating on dot 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 <laughs> metal wood skin stone and pottery etc and then the last one is voices which are shouts screams shrieks wails hoots howls death rattles and sobs and therein are your instruments for conducting an orchestra of noises by the italian futurists who later became subsumed in the uh, fascist party so we, we won't talk about that part. Well, no, um, but I mean, they, you know. Merry Christmas. Death. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Hitler painted a few <laughs> landscapes that weren't totally about killing everyone. I was going to say that Death Rattles and Sobs is right. like an incredible name for their first album. Yeah. But, uh, but then you start thinking about the whole fascist bit, and it like seems equally mm -hmm. as appropriate. Well, I mean, they so they wrote their manifesto around 13 to 15, and I think fascism kind of got roaring in the end of that, so I think fascism may the have The roaring been... fascies? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, that's our band name. <laughs> Album, <laughs> Death oh. Rattles and Sobs. <laughs> Another thing I want to introduce is just a new band name every episode, but it's fine. I mean, you can share the name of my porno. Which is that? All right, it's for you to come up with. I oh. named our band this episode. Well, I'm not, not off the cuff. <laughs> That's not Wait, bad. Off the cuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'll accept it. Um, also, in expanding our, our reach in the digital realm, um, I'd like to do a Twitch stream for one of these. And also, I think it'd be kind of neat to maybe shoot a video and upload it to Pornhub, but have no porn whatsoever. Just... Uh, just a video that we put together. Do you know of that guy that does that? No, but I'm down. Um, I, I, it's like, let's do that. There is this dude who is putting like 7 to 15 second long clips 
on uh, Pornhub, mm-hmm. and they're all like, brother walks in on sister undressing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think the guy's name is Ryan Creamer, if I'm not uh, mistaken. <laughs> um, and it's him, he's like, uh, uh, just like a smiley looking, I assume, British dude. Um, and he opens the door, and it's like the shot of him coming in, and he goes, oh, I'm terribly sorry. I'm gonna leave. And, just shuts and the door. he just shuts the door. <laughs> and he's got like... 12 or 15 or 20 nice. um, videos of just like how you would actually deal with that situation mm-hmm. if you weren't in a porno. I have a compatriot that wanted to make a cooking show and instead of putting it on YouTube, put it on Pornhub. Mm-hmm. Just, you know, cooking, mm-hmm. like how to cook a thing. Yeah. It's a standard cooking show, but just like, yeah, no sexual content whatsoever. And I don't know, would they take it down? Uh, probably would. not. Yeah. Um, especially if the title is like. Um, fucking cooking this pig. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> fucking comma cooking this pig. Pornhub's cool. Yeah. I mean, I love the oh, statistics. They don't give a shit about copyright. That's the thing. Like, I think we can put some fucking copyrighted music on the back of some of these videos, and no one's gonna fucking call us out. Yeah, yeah. And I'm think looking you're for a right. way around this copyright yeah. shit because I want some music on this thing. And mm-hmm. uh, yeah, everything that I read about uh, podcasting is. Pretty, pretty it's cool. like throw it up on Pornhub. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Great. Uh, this episode, incidentally, brought to you by jerking it <laughs> or rubbing that muff. <laughs> rubbing that muff. That's how ladies are jerking it. Wait, how about little pickles? Gherkin it. <laughs> <laughs> Gherkin it with muffs. Uh, and this is the point in this project where I'm like, yeah, I'd listen to this podcast. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs> um, so the topic that I wanted to uh, broach this episode was yet another kind of introduction to something that I want to make a, a repeating <clears throat> theme of each podcast, but this will be a big one, is uh, story time, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which we'll make some bumper music for, and it'll be like, story time, something like that. Where, uh, I was thinking more like story time. Dun, dun. We could have both and play them at the same time. Cool. Yeah. Uh, or let's lay that. I want it like... as dissonant as possible. And if you can slow <laughs> yours down so it's half the speed of mine. Story time. Yeah. Um, so these are stories that don't involve Burning Man, um, but that we have because we're awesome people outside of that thing. Man, I used to get so butthurt before I went to Burning Man when people would ask me if I'd been and I'd tell them no and they're just like, oh, well, you're you're exactly the type. The kind of art you do, like the way you carry yourself, that's like where you should be. And just fucking bristle at that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You don't I have my that. number. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, a lot of the people that I met early on in that thing had a lot of shit that they did beforehand that was pretty impressive and they kind of wanted to come share it with people and it was a good venue to share with a bunch of other weird people Mm -hmm. and yeah now it's you kind of share your weirdness with complete strangers and billionaires and then they're like ha cool I'm gonna take this experience home and put it on my wall yeah is that not good nope (laughs) (laughs) don't want to be a part of it (laughs) done so uh and also like crimes are fun Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of it's not quite the definition of crime, but fun and crime, the Venn diagram, they overlap a lot. Uh, I believe in the iris of that Venn diagram is scofflaw. Yes. yes. I, like, <laughs> when people are confronting me on the sidewalk or something and telling me that my dogs are supposed to be on a leash mm-hmm. when they're behaving perfectly, but whether they are or not, like, who are you to tell me how to handle my business when I am obviously handling my business? Mm -hmm. Yeah, if your dog is, like, mauling a child, then, yeah, maybe a tap on the shoulder and a stern tisk tisk. (laughs) I'm going to kick that child away from my dog, like, long before my dog bites that child. Did you see what that child was wearing? (laughs) He was asking for it. (laughs) The speakeasy that I worked at in Seattle did have a house rapper named King Dro, and Uh he made a song about it called Shh, Speakeasy. And it's, it's adorable. Yeah, no, it's a really good track. Um, I do hate the title for this episode, but remembering oh, I that it is that track, yes. I'm 
fine with it. Well, that's um, the point. I mean, that's what speakeasy means. Is like, hey, don't spread it around. But there's a cool place you can go. Like, don't tell cops. And don't tell people that are dumb. So speak easy. Don't speak loud. Like, come to this party, and it's going to be awesome. Man, Let's I... Let's an episode about how great gatekeeping is. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we, we were both involved in speakeasies in our past. And, like, I didn't even know I was doing it. It sounds uh, like your speakeasy was, like, a speakeasy you intended oh, to Oh, there, there are have. write-ups in the in newspapers about... In the uh, Seattle was, Voice? <laughs> No, uh, the stranger. stranger. Yeah, and uh, the post intelligence, or excuse me, uh, was actually. I'm jumping ahead. Fair enough. Um, so, I lived. I, I grew up in Pennsylvania, um, and there were like actual legal bars that were in barns, hmm. like on dirt roads that I used to drink at. They were they had a incredible. License. Yeah. Um, they were like, but like, you know, they, it, it was the country. Like if you had a mm-hmm. barn that was big enough and like you could get a liquor license from the state. Yeah. Why not? Y- you keep it. Um, so, so it made sense to me when I was presented with this problem that like, I would just stock a bunch of liquor, um, growing up in the country, like your friends stock a bunch of liquor if they're party houses. Mm-hmm. Um, your friend's parents like taught you to do this by yeah. going to like you know Fourth of July parties and other holiday parties at their house, or just like every weekend or whenever WWF is on. Yeah. Um. So I moved to upstate New York after going to college in Pennsylvania and didn't really know anyone. Um, I was asked to move out of my parents' house. Um, either within three months or I would have to start paying rent. And I was just like, oh, folks, super funny. Um, we are never getting to that point. Um, and a couple weeks later, I got my first, like, real job with uh, an I-9. And, uh, what and is an I-9? That's the thing that you fill out um, that says, like, you're oh, a citizen. with, with an I, I thought that was a company. That's dumb. Uh, I, get, I get it now. It was with the, an engineering form, company. The form, I know. Um, that was in the uh, original office building that Sears was started in, apparently. Who knows if that's true? I never checked it on the internet. There was nothing that, like, you were able to prove was mm-hmm. real There's in so the early 2000s, late 90s. I, I, I tell people, like, oh, yeah, no, this was this thing that has this historical context. And they're like, oh, yeah? And I'm like, well... I mean, everyone thought so. Yeah, everyone told I mean, me no that. One, no one said it wasn't. <laughs> Allegedly. Definitely. Yeah, no, definitely did not have the internet back then. Everyone at work told me that it was the Sears Roebuck building, mm-hmm. so I guess it was. Um, and uh, uh, I've, I've been in plays and acting since I was in, like, second grade. Um, and randomly, I get a phone call after a couple weeks of uh, living in upstate New York from someone who knows someone that I went to high school with who said I was a good actor back then they just had an actor drop out can I learn an entire part in like a week and a half and go on in this like semi-primary role and I'm like yeah totally so I do um, and I meet this woman that uh, both you and I know so you know Oh, that one. Um, yeah, who Does will she not... Have a, she has a nickname? I don't remember it. No, I've mostly put her out of my mind for she... uh, reasons not associated with this. Ooh, but we can tell that podcast. story. <laughs> yeah, oh my god. We could certainly time. do that chronicle. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, like, uh, I do this play, and she is the one, like, real counterculture person in it who isn't, like, an upstate New York person, because... She's from Austin, and uh, she grew up in or, like, spent some time in a place that's, like, as cool as the Bay Area or cooler. Um, And she worked at a bar. And I started going to that bar because we were friends. Um, And then I started uh, bouncing at that bar. And, And it got to the point that I was, like, so enmeshed in... In that party culture of this singular bar um, on Main Street in Johnson City, that we we would like 
party until the bar closed at 2, clean up the bar. By 2.30, we'd be back at my house. Um, cause and like the bar was back open at your house. And the bar was back open at my house. I had the entire <laughs> first floor okay. of a house for 4.15 a month, <gasps> only because I had a cat. Um, it was uh, three ninety a month before that, <laughs> and they charged me an extra twenty five bucks as uh, as like cat rent. Those are the days. Um, yeah, and it's just me living there, and I had a kitchen, a living room, a bedroom, an office, and like I turned the front room into a bar, which uh, I called the Blue Monkey, and I've still got that uh, brass sign that like I punched very gently with a nail and a hammer and then uh, boot blacked mm -hmm. um, so that I don't know what that style is uh, someone can at me on uh, on the Twitters um, do you have a Twitter? what is it? I do it's uh, at a3rd underscore day so it's like a third day or accuracy third day with D-Day in there it's stupid all of my things are stupid um, and Minor they're thought out too much do you want to have a stupid off? Um, no <laughs> not right now who wins the stupid um, <laughs> it, well, wait, stupid wait. time the future is terrifying <laughs> so um, I have this bar which is made out of uh, the kitchen table that I grew up with at my folks house that my dad made um, it's all of this uh, tile that he and my mom got from uh, um, Barcelona like when they went to Barcelona in the early 70s. Um, and it's framed out really nicely. And I just got the table um, top itself because it was hanging off the wall at my folks' house. So I figured out how to make it legs. Like I put a cabinet next to it. I had a neat lamp above it. Like I put some lounge chairs in the room. Uh, the room could totally comfortably hold like maybe 12, 15 people. Um, That's a good number. But And hanging off the front of the house was like a semi-enclosed um, porch. Mm -hmm. So people could like be half outside in the winter and uh, be smoking outside. Which is only a thing I instituted when we were doing bar time because it was the early 2000s and we did just smoke in our houses. Mm -hmm. um, I remember those. So we're just having bar party at my house. Right, um, but I mean, you're putting up all the booze, right? You need three, to, four nights a week. You should, you should maybe get reimbursed for this. Maybe. Sounds like um, and there is in Vestal, New York, um, or there was at least um, a super nice liquor store. One of the ones where you get like the one third size metal wire shopping carts mm. when you get in oh, there yeah, yeah. with the basket underneath mm. for uh, yeah. all of the like three liter bottles of liquor. Um, and I didn't do any of that shitty, um, illegal and immoral shit of putting, uh, low quality booze in nice. high quality yeah. bottles. Um, this is so tempting. So but, tempting. but I did make sure that I was buying decent bottles for myself and like mm -hmm. my core group of like seven to 10 friends. Well, yeah, that's the top shelf. That's the thing you keep in the secret place. And that is how you make some people yeah. feel special. And there's the yeah. shitty shit for, like, the well drink cocktails, where it really doesn't oh, like, matter do the quality of the gin. Oh, you're an understudy for a bit part? Oh, yeah, sure. I get you a vodka tonic. That's fine. Seagram's it is. Oh, no, we were we were given Bankers Club. Um, yeah. All y'all on the East Coast. It's an East Coast, West Coast thing. We all have different shitty vodkas. Um, yeah, like, well, not just vodka. Like, Popov. if, uh, if uh, vodka of the gods or Popov was an entire line of mm -hmm. liquor, um, Bankers Club is the shit that used to be in Pennsylvania and at least upstate New York by where I grew up um, that had everything from like brandy to the regular liquors that you'd think of as really cheap to like the really shitty schnapps that you'd mm. think of as like the Kuiper. So, um, <laughs> so, so I've got this bar and I'm, I'm working like with fucking abused and abandoned kids in, uh, in a childcare um, facility at this point, and I'm making 11.50 an hour. Um, and I can't afford the like 250 to 375 that I'm paying every week and a half or so in liquor, because I'm having like 10 parties every two and a half weeks mm -hmm. um, at my house. <clears throat> So I realized that if I charge what the liquor costs, plus like six or seven percent, the liquor pays for itself 
and the liquor pays for me and my buddy Jeff and his wife Shauna and in, in the drug culture that I grew up in that is mm-hmm. called a runner's fee Ooh, yeah. I didn't have a term for it but I charged a runner's fee for my bars yes. um, and like, it was I'm great I'm going to spend the time to go get it so uh, I don't know give me a couple and I mean it, it gave me a, a couple dollars left over mm-hmm. which uh, I'm sure if uh, I were to do actual accounting of it, would have paid for the uh, the toilet paper. Oh, actual and accounting is terrible. Never do that. Yeah. It will make um, you very sad. This goes on for like, I want to say five months. Sounds good. That's a good run. Um, it might be like three and a half months. Um, it feels like I did a lot more lying months. to myself back then than I do now, Except but it feels society. real five months. It feels months-y. like it's true. It's true. Um, and... Like, it's, it's a Friday night or a Saturday night. Um, it was a big night at the bar. Like, maybe 20 people came home with me. Um, three or four left immediately. And then there were a bunch of folks drinking until, like, 4.35 in the morning. And most of them are gone. And uh, then there's, like, one of those big, heavy knocks on my porch door. Well, um, cop knock. Yeah. Yeah, cop knock. Yeah. And, like... <clears throat> I don't think I heard it. I think somebody told me there was a knock at the door. Um, but luckily, like, I leave my house, I close that door, everyone's on silent ship, mm-hmm. and I open up the uh, the porch door, and there is a tall, real fat, um, real upstate New york cop. <laughs> and there is a small little Irish guy. <laughs> and I'm real drunk and super uh, tired. Of course. Um, and and I'm just like, oh, hello, officers. Uh, I'm sorry, I was just having a little party. Um, it's broken up. Uh, like, is everything cool? <laughs> and the little Irish guy's just like, oh, no, <laughs> no, 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 nothing's cool. Oh, you just transformed into a little leprechaun there. That, uh, that voice was perfect. <laughs> was it? Yeah. yeah. It was real hard to get into. <laughs> um, so, so he's he he tells me that like some dude got into an accident um, on icy streets. Oh no! And like skidded into an embankment and like fucked up his car on a pole. And uh, he said that he was drinking at my house. So, so they're just like, and and we hear you throw parties here a lot. And I was just like, eh, not really. I so mean, like that, I, I work like at I work at this the, bar down the street, work. and like I tell them the name of the bar, and they're just like, oh yeah yeah yeah. And, like, and I bounce there and stuff, and like you know, um, I work nights, and like when people go to bed at two thirty, like I usually work till eight thirty nine in the morning, mm-hmm. and get to bed at like eleven. Like that's my mid afternoon. We come back here and we drink. And then I th- thought, like, I was about to say, and, you know, I buy booze, and I charge, like, <laughs> yeah, no, don't say five that. to seven no, percent. No, no. And the money changing hands, that's the key. And <laughs> as that goes through my head, the next thought comes, and the next thought about why the cops are there. Right. And I'm just like, oh, my God, I'm running an illegal bar. <laughs> and uh, the big uh, fattish cop goes, you what? And the little Irish guy goes, I don't think he realized till just now. <laughs> and I was just like, no. Like, I, Wait, no, like, I was just charging my friends. Like, I don't, I don't start moves. sobbing. <laughs> but also um, strangers. <laughs> but, but I do like sobbing, but it's just like, no, you don't understand. Like, I, I work with these fucking kids and they don't pay me anything and I work all night and then I do this thing. And like, I was, I was spending like a third of the money that I bring home on booze for these people that I barely know to come to my house. Um, and I give them this whole spiel, and after like four or five minutes, um, they they quiet me down. Oh, you um, drunk white girl cried your way out of it. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, my God, I, I've done that for like two potential DUIs. Uh, I, I at cops very well. Um, <laughs> but, <Yeah>. uh... <laughs> um, so, so, like, they don't they don't give me a ticket. 
Um, they don't do whatever they do to people who are running speakeasies oh, in terms of find out running them into jail. To people that uh, run speakeasies from my story. Yeah, it's so pretty awesome. So whatever that is, none of that happens. What does happen is uh, Officer Clubfoot and Officer O'Grady. Um, <laughs> the tall, fat one, uh, I would call him Shrek. Great. Um, so Shrek, uh, Officer Shrek and Officer O'Grady um, end up coming back to my house at so random funny. times between like 3 and 5.30 oh, in the morning. The morning. For the next, like, 14 months. What else are they going to do? It's a small town. Yeah, and they, they, like, come by, and they knock on the door, and they say hi, and they expect me to explain to them who everybody in my house is in relation to me at a moment's notice. (laughs) That's not... I don't think that's within their purview. (laughs) It's not. Um, But, like, nobody told me that you don't have to... So I don't know how that It's that country shit. Like, nobody told us that you don't have to let a cop into your house. Like, (laughs) cops came into the houses where we were drinking when we were in high school, and, like, Damien Scales pissed on my friend Kevin Kelly, who was passed out, like, in front of their house. Um, Like... Like, we didn't grow up with healthy boundaries yeah. <laughs> between, like, law and people. Um, yeah, uh, it, it was, like, it was funnier than it was dangerous to yeah. me. Well, that's um, nice. Like, now it is terrifying, yeah. the thought of letting a police officer into my house. But, like, I totally used to let them into the front room of my place. Mm-hmm. And... And, like, run through, like, this is Jeff, this is Jeff's wife, like, this is his cousin mm-hmm. so-and-so, like, this is her brother this and that, like, Fuck this is hurt. my friend so-and-so, and I work with these two folks. Um, yeah. And they'd be like, okay, um, I don't see any money out, make sure there's no money out when I come back here. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and part of it is actually, like, a taxation thing. They, they, they want to get money for the county or, you know, whatever, for the liquor license. If That's we're not going to make rich people pay for <clears throat> the gigantic fucking properties and homes they have, they're going to target the people without high-priced lawyers. <laughs> this podcast is brought to you by Solidarity. Solidarity. How do I buy that? Get some. <laughs> Where do I get it? I got $10. Can I get some Solidarity? Uh, you can fucking pull your nuts up and uh, act like a person whose nuts are pulled up um, or who's... Uh, um, what are those things that are connected to your lady fallopian tubes? Ovaries? Um, yeah, you can pull your ovaries <laughs> right the fuck out um, and get some solidarity with uh, people who pull need to be unionizing. Pull your ovaries out and your nuts up. Thank you. I couldn't have said it better. No problem. You didn't. That's why they call me daddy issues. <laughs> uh, this podcast is also brought to you by Shadows, also known as the poor man's mirror. <laughs> have you ever needed to check your hair but didn't have a mirror? You oh, know what? God. Just shine a light towards your head and look at a wall. You can see kind of what your hair is doing. Yeah, whatever the opposite of stand your ground is, that is also sponsoring this podcast. Sit Give your, your place. Sit your air. Uh, <laughs> mud? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Sponsored by mud. Yeah. <laughs> and juice. <laughs> mud. You like water? You like earth? Uh, it's in the middle. We're uh-huh. not really ground. <laughs> All right, so um, my speakeasy story is a little bit more involved. Um, starts with me and some of my friends living in Seattle, and we found a really great little uh, warehouse space underneath a tattoo shop in Capitol Hill. There's one rule. <laughs> if the fire department knocks, don't let them in. They're only good for two things, putting out fires and shutting things down. And we didn't want to get shut down. Or vice versa. Yeah. So it was super cheap, uh, and it... Turns when is out, this? This is, uh, I'd say, 2005 in Seattle. Well after I knew you. Oh, yes. So you came from where to upstate New York and went to where? God, I went from Texas to upstate New York and then back to Seattle mm. and then to the Bay Area after that. Uh, it's after I'd, like, toured the country a couple times. But, um... Yeah, I wanted to put down some roots mm-hmm. and uh, hooked back up with a very old friend of mine who is a dude that has a master's degree in painting and also has macular degeneration and was turning blind. Joe? Yes, Joe! Oh, I love Joe. I haven't he, seen him in, like, maybe 12, 15 years. And he hasn't seen you either. He hasn't seen much of anything. He's blind. Uh, is his brain still making up the shit that his eyes can't see? That's what brains do. Yeah. Ah. Uh, 
beautiful. Um, yeah, I haven't talked to him much, but uh, he has a kid. Good. Yeah, just seems to be doing okay. Mm -hmm. um, so we got a place, and uh, so the music that I shared last time in the please don't listen to this if you might get disturbed addendum mm -hmm. to the podcast, which won't be in the feed, but you can find it if you want. Um, my co-conspirator in that had a 900 watt PA system in our little humble abode and would just like fuck around with noise music be like super loud at like five six in the morning cool because none of us cared right and we didn't think we had a neighbor because it was a basement and nothing else was there and i got a knock on the door this dude was like hey not a cop knock <laughs> maybe a it was a nice knock are cops allowed to fuck around with their knocks like that? I don't think so. <laughs> I also I think they, don't think they, so. I think they're trained to do a cop knock every time. <clears throat> but, um, so I answered it, and this dude is like, Hey, um, sorry to bother you, but, you know, my girlfriend's trying to sleep. We, we live next door. I was like, I had no idea there was even a place next door. <laughs> <laughs> you guys like, live oh, no. here? <laughs> right, no, like, all of us were just, like, underground little scum fucks. And, uh, I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. You He's were like, filthy when I knew you. I, this was a step up from that. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're going to do an entire episode about the pants that I met you in. I love those pants, <laughs> man. I love them. I, I, I threw them in a burn barrel and someone fished them out before they burned and tried to give them back to me. And I was like, no, I'm done with them. That's disgusting. Um, I have a hoodie that uh, Jason tried to steal from me um, years ago. Uh, that I told him I would end our friendship over if he didn't give it back. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and he did. And I ended our friendship over something else much later. Oh, but no. if he's listening to this and he wants that melt hoodie, I will send him that melt hoodie now. Melt mm. banana? Uh, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> uh, apparently, <laughs> it's some. Um, uh, um, what's that goddamn awful band that does the noodling hippie shit? fish yes um <laughs> apparently it's some lyric from a fish song oh, no. um but i didn't know that for like the first 10 years i had it Ew. but within a week three people were just like you like fish i saw them da -da 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 -da. and after the third person in a couple days said that i was just like what the fuck that. is going yeah, on <laughs> can i excise it from just life? like yeah man you know unzip something something melt and i was like it this is my melt hoodie <laughs> the fuck are you talking about but you uh so this we're guy, in seattle uh takes us to the weird spot in our house that opens into the basement it's a basically a seven story very old building there's a boiler in there with pipes going everywhere to heat the whole thing and when it turns on it sounds like a jet engine and it just like flames shoot out of it it looks like a uh, fucking uh, nightmare on elm street movie it's fucking beautiful and he like knocks on the wall and he's like hey honey and we hear this hey i'm right here and it sounds like she's in the room with us and i'm like oh my god yeah we are making so much noise and there's absolutely no baffling i'm so sorry and he's like oh by the way if your friend is doing music i do music i'd be happy to teach him some things because <laughs> <laughs> friend, uh, he he wasn't trying to please anyone right <laughs> which came across uh easily and so this guy's like, oh yeah, no, I was in this band Chikung. And I was like, wait, what? Chikung? Because I had been listening to Chikung like eight years previous in mm -hmm. my uh, previous, uh, the time that I was in Seattle before. And loved him. Threw a great show. Anarchist as fuck. Just amazing, just like lighting gasoline on fire in bathtubs in the middle of downtown Seattle with people in orange vests just directing traffic to make it look like it's totally fine. <laughs> That, I was like, wait, that that's is you? the that, that's the wonder of having an orange vest yes. or a a golf shirt that mm -hmm. is black that says security or staff yeah. in white across the back. So this guy's name is Rick, and he was the lead singer of Chikung. Uh, he's also in the Infernal Noise Brigade. The Infernal Noise Brigade uh, came from Chikung during the '99 uh, WTO protests in Seattle. Mm. They're like, all these people are protesting, and we just want to keep their spirits up. So they like started a marching band uh, full of just like anarchists, just like black mask, gas mask, like 
drum corps and then they like toured like Prague and stuff like did a bunch of like crazy the normies are all like why are you wearing gas masks and I'm all like they're firing tear gas at us Uh (laughs) for standing and shouting Mm -hmm. yeah that's a it's another story but I was I lived in the middle of the exclusion zone in the WTO protest so I Mm -hmm. couldn't actually go home because my ID didn't have that address wow they actually had cops on every street corner checking for cell phones and gas masks and they would arrest you if you had either and so we struck up a conversation about our mutual uh, appreciation of anarchy and crazy shit and he was about to launch a little private club in his place next door which is basically a storage unit (laughs) (laughs) like it was a storage unit with a hot plate and like uh, basically a bathroom but not for long and uh, he started up a card game it was fun and he already had a bunch of anarchist connections so we had a bunch of really cool people show up and uh and check it out got a little write-up in the stranger um they had a uh, a, a stop sign or not a stop sign a, like a street light out front had a red yellow and green and so red meant we are closed mm-hmm. yellow meant we are at capacity come back later and green meant uh we have some room come on in right uh, he also had cameras outside of his door so that you could tell who was knocking on the door and if you didn't want to answer it, you just didn't answer it. Which I think might have helped you in your mm-hmm. situation. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a simple solution. There's well, like a camera above the door and just like a TV on the other side. Didn't know what I was doing. I know. It helps <laughs> to know what you're doing when yeah. you're criming. Oh, I'm not sharp. It helps not to know sharp. that you're criming when you're criming. Yeah. <laughs> I just, I imagine I have an autonomy society doesn't want me to have. Yes, that's true. Um, so it, it got pretty popular, and then pretty much everyone that was a customer of that mm-hmm. became an employee because they are like, sure. this is really cool. And then uh, we knew a filmmaker who was actually making a film about Cthulhu that had Tori Spelling in it. And so she was up there shooting. And after the film wrapped they still had access to this huge uh, production warehouse. Right. And so we know a rich guy that kind of co-signed. Honest to God, amazing rich guy, which really made me feel good about rich guys. He Mm -hmm. actually, he was friends with all these just scumbag uh, punk rock motherfuckers with, like, debt. And he's like, all right, I have business-grade loans that I can get, which are, like, 2%. What's your percentage? Like, 10, 13 he would just transfer people's debt. Right. And just be like, just, yeah, just pay me the 2% because uh, mm-hmm. individual debt is garbage. And I have institutional connections and I want your life to be better. Um, so we move into this larger space. And it's actually subdivided. There's this weird cranky dude that has uh, just a ton of machinery mm-hmm. in half of it. And the other half was the production studio. So we set up a bar and we uh, go f- to make like a, a big... Uh, blowout party to celebrate moving from the tiny storage unit Mm -hmm. to a place where you can actually do cool shit. Right. Um, And Rick did manage to have like a poker game and some blackjack in his storage unit. But now we had like a roulette table, two tables of blackjack and like two tables of Texas Hold'em with like seriously 25 and 50 cent Mm -hmm. limes. It wasn't big. It was just to make sure that the person that was dealing wasn't just donating their time it was purely pretty much just operating costs and then a bar at the back and we would sell after 2 a.m and then we also had some burlesque and they wouldn't use pasties Ooh. <laughs> oh but that's a that's a big deal in the pacific northwest it is it's dumb it's a dumb <laughs> law and we wanted to break it in we pennsylvania also sold, we i also mean sold cuban cigars out of the coat check because oh. that's a dumb law too how dare you we had a uh, Valentine's Day massacre party where uh, if you came... So, number one, we had a camera outside the door again. Mm-hmm, and our mm-hmm, security mm-hmm. was uh, Army Rangers. There weren't just, like, fucking cameras back then. Like, no, no, there's, like, like it, it wasn't ass. like I would have gotten a camera like, no, was, from was, Best Buy or was, some was, shit. No, it was simple CCTV. No, it was 2005, 2006. They're, they're cheap. Yeah. They had... Uh, they I'm had, defending me back in 2002, yeah. 2003. Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't fucking know what you guys did, knowing what you were doing and thinking about it. <laughs> so all of our security had tuxedos, mm-hmm. and they were also uh, army rangers. Um, one of them, like the guy that ran it, Muddy, was a sniper. 
Oh, we had no whoa. problems ever. What, what Muddy had was a pocket full of drink tickets and a real can-do attitude. <laughs> if someone was making a problem, he would take them aside and be like, look, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to give you a couple drink tickets and you're going to have a good time. And you're going to stay away from that guy mm -hmm. because no one wants any trouble. So here's your drink tickets. Have a good night. No one did a goddamn thing. There. That's really smart. Our uh, our mutual friend um, who bartended in that bar in upstate New York, um, mm -hmm. she taught me that as a bartender, you are the drug dealer of the house, mm -hmm. and you never actually have to deal with anyone creating a problem. What you have to do is get on the bar and tell everyone in the bar that nobody is getting more drinks until you get those two motherfuckers out of here. Yep. Um, and I'm loud enough so I didn't have to get on the bar. But, like, that's how I bounce. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't have to do shit if you let everybody... <coughs> if you let everybody know that you're cutting them off. Mm -hmm. We also... So we had a... Uh... Mobs. Mobs are great. Well... Okay. Prove to me whenever mobs mob, have been I bad. I call it a group of friends <laughs> with, with some shared interests. <laughs> Because that's what it was. I mean, we were all breaking laws, and we were all, like, anarchist little pieces of shit. And we had a shared goal, to have a good time. And in, we did. In a neat place. And so uh, we made sure that there was a dress code. Mm -hmm. You had to be dressed up in, like, a tux or gangster attire or flapper dress. Uh, gender neutral. Like, if you wanted to cross-dress, that's totally fine. Uh -huh. But when people came up with, like, a hoodie and sweatpants and knocked on the door, we just wouldn't answer it because we had the camera. And, That's smart. Yeah, and they got sad and walked away. Which comes but back to bite set, us in the ass later. <laughs> like, like we're those folk. Um, if if we know that there's like a thematic like speakeasy party happening somewhere, oh, I will dress the fuck up. Exactly. And what Rick said is like, hey, remember that you know, regardless of what you are doing tonight, mm -hmm. there's 40 other people that are the main characters in their own movie, and you're an extra in that movie, so you better look the part. Right. Um, you know where a speakeasy comes from, right? So, so the whole code word thing wasn't ever a specific code word back in the day. Of course. They wanted people who, like, were a part of their set to come to their parties. And, like, they weren't thinking about costumes the way that we think about costumes now. So you were expected to, like, be able to like use slang mm -hmm. and like speak like a member of your set yeah easy mm -hmm. as it yeah. were to be allowed into these places where like you were going to be around the fucking hipsters of yeah, your day the white guy comes in and he's like hello gents am I, i'm looking for some broccoli that means marijuana Could and I? there's no internet yeah, course, or like yeah. real mass media back then so people who, like, aren't in the counterculture mm -hmm. don't know to say dude mm -hmm. and dudette mm -hmm. instead of sir and ma'am. Yeah. That's so, it. Yeah, it, it. Again, um, gatekeeping, I, I mm -hmm. think, is valuable. Uh, I think a lot of cool shit could have not been ruined had there been a little bit more gatekeeping, which uh, may make me an asshole. I don't know. But, um... So we had our first party, which is a Valentine's Day Massacre. Mm -hmm. So if you showed up uh, as an individual, your ticket was $5. If you came in as a couple, it was 15 for the both of you. <laughs> and you got a <laughs> raffle ticket mm -hmm. as a couple. And uh, then we did this uh, announcement where the raffle was pulled, mm -hmm. but it was a completely, it was a fake raffle. So all the couples like looked it up. And uh, my roommate and a friend of ours Got, we're like, oh, they, we won, we won. So they, they get upstairs on the stage, and Rick is out there talking about how much we really respect love and how, you know, coming together is beautiful. And I'm on stage with a fedora and a trench coat with the collar pulled up and a gun in my pocket. <laughs> and in the middle of Rick's uh, exposition about how much we love love, I pull the gun out with blanks and just shoot both of the people that quote unquote won the raffle for anyone <laughs> for anyone who has never like been in a theater when actual blanks are fired on stage it's loud um they are so amazingly loud and they are also <clears throat> usually only like half or a quarter of the black powder that is actually in a bullet 
um, but what blanks are is just the cartridge, the copper cartridge of a bullet filled with black powder and crimped at the top. Um, and, and then can also kill people. And yeah, because the shrapnel couldn't come out. Yes. Um, and instead of like the barrel moving forward, it comes out the top of the barrel of the gun. So you have to hold it real weird and away from your face so that it doesn't vent right next to your head. And uh, so we'd actually done... And they're so fucking loud. Oh, my God. <laughs> no, the entire crowd just <laughs> fucking shut the fuck up. And I heard a couple of people like, oh, my God, what the fuck? And then the marching band started a funeral dirge <laughs> and came in and they took the bodies off the stage. And just because we thought that people were going to freak out, like, I had different clothes and I walked off stage, dumped the gun, the real gun, <laughs> into a person in the audience, went outside, changed my clothes, and came back in a different door. That dude put the gun in a trunk and drove the car around the corner. <laughs> and we had uh, sound checked it beforehand to see, like, how loud it was going to be outside. So, like, we fucking set it up. You know what's art? That's art. <laughs> <laughs> Terrifying people and then having a marching band come in and just fucking tear it up. That's what makes it art. Yeah. Um, like, yeah, if you have two sh gunshots go off and then, like, right into Danny Boy. <laughs> um, that assuages a lot of fear. Um, beer me and keep telling me your uh, your tragic tale of woe. Oh, it was not a tragic tale of woe. Something ends terribly. Someone goes to jail, but prison, I guess. Uh, it, but it's it's uh, it's a twisted tale of police fucking malfeasance, honestly. And I'll make that case. <laughs> I know you may think, well, you guys are just <sighs> breaking the law and you're going to get what's coming to you. Uh, no, I want to say that no, before no. when I said Officer uh, Damien Scales peed on my friend, um, I don't want that edited out. So if you've edited out that already, keep this in, um, saying that he's a shitbag. Officer Damien Scales yep. peed on your friend. Yes. Okay. They shouldn't do Kicked that. him in the ass first and then peed on him. But... That seems like something they should not do. No, no. I mean, it was funny when I was 17, but, like, in hindsight, that is completely inappropriate behavior. Yeah. So that kicks off our new uh, place where we can actually have, like, 100, 200 people. Mm -hmm. um, after a while, the person that shares the space with all the machinery decides this is fucking crazy and moves all of his shit out. And then we have a theater and build risers. And uh, then we get a house wrapper, house burlesque troupe, and um, circus contraption is a weird underground kind of uh, piratey um, punk zombie sort of troupe. Mm -hmm. It's hard to describe. Uh, KMFDM came and hung out. Oh, no fucking yeah, way. Yeah, I, I was offered uh, ecstasy from one of the guys from KMFDM, but I was like literally just completely fucking sick. Did they hold like, up? They were nice guys. Oh, they. Oh no no no! I mean the music. No, I haven't. I don't okay. think so. Thank you. No. <laughs> um, I've I've been oh, avoiding well, going back up. to look at it well, no, um, no, no, no. because of that. Back. No, their their old music is still cool. I just don't think that they're still making cool music. Oh okay okay. That's okay, right. That's, yeah, yeah no that's fine. that's what I think. Like I I don't want to yeah. go back to their first three four albums. Oh no! I'll, I'll probably I'll put it on the uh, YouTube Lovely. accompaniment playlist because I have already put a playlist together full of bands that. Uh, were featured at. I love that. The Speakeasy. Um, this is pretty cool. Uh, King Dro, like, is this rapper that came out with a cape with God, a space everything needle. you do, Google needs their fucking cut. Something. Wait, well, I mean, we can't put their music in our podcast because of licensing. I can so, put King Dro's in. I can. Well, do that. But, like, to. the rest of it is on YouTube. Right. And that's the way that we're able to share with people yes. that listen to us what this we're is, into. This is my head And Google the gets wall. their fucking cut of that. Yes. Ethics is bullshit. We'll see. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm exploring options to uh, put these Great. sorts of things together in a non-standard way that people could maybe get if they wanted to hit me up. Awesome. Love that. But, um... So he would get on stage with a cape with a space needle on it, mm -hmm. and he had a belt buckle that was just made of $100 bills and glitter. And uh, he had this thing called Pimp Dust, which was just cast, like casks of glitter, and he would just throw them in the crowd and be like, I'm sprinkling Pimp Dust on all the ladies. It was fucking funny as fuck. 
Taking that to its logical conclusion, what does that mean? That the ladies themselves become pimps, or do they get churned <laughs> no, out? There's no logic in this guy. Uh uh-uh. uh. No. It was just. He used to hang out with Dolomite. He would. The oh, second, no shit. The second you meet him within, like, about five minutes, he's going to let you know that Dolomite told him he was cool. And he was. He's a fucking That's awesome fair. guy. Um, also, <laughs> when I worked with fucked up kids, one of them told me that, like, if we were on the streets, he would turn me out. And I was like. But you wouldn't. <laughs> it was like, no, 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 I would. Uh, I did, like, worse shit to people that are, like, tougher than you. I was like, yeah, but you don't understand. Mm-hmm. You wouldn't turn me out. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, I know that my job is, like, not to argue with you and to redirect your energy and, like, make sure that, like, you stay appropriate. But, like, I'm not budging on this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we did that for a while. We'd have a show like every week or every two weeks, and it was pretty popular. And then um, a reporter from the Seattle Post Intelligencer, I could be wrong about that. It could have been the other newspaper that was active at that time, but it doesn't matter anymore because there's only one now. Right. They merged. Uh, one of the reporters came and knocked on our door and was not dressed up. Mm-hmm. So the door did not get opened. And they went home and wrote literally like a two-paragraph uh, story saying, oh, yeah, so the other day I was uh, out drinking with my friends, and they were like, oh, you should come check out this thing. And we went, and there was nothing. It was at 235, this street. <laughs> and it was shitty because I didn't get let in. Mm-hmm. So, bam, all of a sudden we're kind of outed by a, just a jilted fucking rep- Porter is and going into it we all knew like there's no fucking way that this goes on forever Mm -hmm. it's fine like some of those poker games went on for three days it's fine and we had actually kind of canvassed the businesses around and kind of been like hey we're gonna have some parties it's cool but there's this uh, very old school um piano bar that was kind of one of the staples of the gay community on capitol hill in seattle and uh the owner was like with us and then with the against us and then with us and then against us and uh, that dude ended up calling the gaming commission because he was like oh they have illegal gambling in there so we had this huge blowout show at about 300 people and we're like this is it the end of cafe un-american oh so Casablanca Rick mm-hmm. uh, is the main character Humphrey Bogart um, his cafe is called the cafe american in Casablanca against the Nazis, you know, doing some underground illegal weird shit. So we called it Cafe on American because the main guy was Rick and Wow. And Nazis are not cool. Nazis are still not cool. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Yeah, people died to be like, fuck you, you fucking Nazis. Right. So that was the theme there. And uh so the last night the gaming commission actually got an undercover person into our last show and witnessed our 25 and 50 cent of blinds poker and then we stopped but he they had already set up this whole organization to get him as an undercover Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so they sent him to make friends with rick which he did and rick still had poker games at his house in the uh, storage unit so this guy brian who his persona was a trust fund college kid that wanted to live on the edge with a shaven head and a bro attitude. What? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Motivated reasoning, man. <laughs> I had tapped the fuck out at this point. I was like, this is, this is too much. You guys are, you guys are a little out. And at that point I had moved to San Francisco. But this dude, Brian, convinced Rick that we didn't have to end the speakeasy. We could do it again. And he had a trust fund, so he could front the money to get a new space for it if Rick could just marshal his forces and, like, make it happen again. Right. Because they wanted to convict someone for something because they spent the goddamn money. They ended up spending, like, over $6 million of Seattle PD money (laughs) renting a downtown warehouse. Like, so... This guy, Brian, like, bankrolls, renting a whole new place, but Rick is like, 
we have to have a legit front organization while we do this speakeasy, like building in the back for, you know, doing all the crazy shit. So I'm going to talk to all my artist friends and have art studios, and we're going to rent them out for super cheap mm -hmm. to all these artists, and we're going to have a gallery out front, just as a front, but literally just did that. So all these artists got super cheap rent in downtown <laughs> Seattle with a frontage on like 6th Street. On SPD's dime. Yeah. Yes, on SPD's dime. He didn't know that at the time, but he was like, fuck over this fucking rich kid. Great. And the kid's like, okay, can we start it? Can we start it? Can we start it? And like, all my friends are kind of fuck ups. So like, yeah, they like work on it, but then they kind of party and then they kind of work on it and then they kind of party. So they never actually started <laughs> the next speakeasy. Mm -hmm. This dude, so we had some sketchy friends. This dude came and w had a beef with someone that was working there, pounded on the back door. The dude comes out and he's like, What the fuck? And they get in their little argument, and this ex army dude just shoots a bunch of rounds straight up in the air to threaten one of our friends. Cops get called, cops show up, cops leave, nothing. <laughs> Whew. Cops are like, uh, it seems to be dealt with. Uh, we're good. What? Which, yeah, because this was a sting. They didn't oh. want to fuck up and compromise the sting. Well, at that point, <laughs> y'all got to get out. Where this, where this dude, this Brian undercover guy who's been doing this for about a year, he's trying to convince people to make a gambling establishment where they do... Uh, Texas hold him for 25 and 50 cent lines so that he can get them on state gambling charges. <laughs> it's like every time the FBI a gets year. a terrorist. <laughs> <laughs> Just like, well, like, the, this asshole was like, I hate America. Mm -hmm. And then we helped him grow a movement yep. and sold him <laughs> explosives him bombs, that don't work. The and then we arrested him and mm -hmm. put him in jail. Keep funding our program. Mm -hmm. uh, can you guys put more uh, wood on the fire? It's chilly. Thank you. Your love hurts. Love hurts. Your love hurts. You're singing now? She is. Love hurts. Cool. It's singing time. So, then what happened? I don't know, where were we? Okay, so Brian. So, yeah, they have basically half a block of a downtown property that the Seattle Police Department is paying rent on like waiting for them to start doing some crimes and then my friends being fuckos just can't get their shit together <laughs> enough do to their do crimes. crimes. <laughs> but in the meantime, we had a lot of fun there <laughs> pretending to build a fucking speakeasy. It's really cool. <laughs> Isn't it though? <laughs> Look, yeah. It like shoots guns out in the fucking back and the cops are just like, uh, it's cool, we got it handled, no problem. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, like, they get a little fucking fed up for running this fucking sting for a year or two. And, uh, like, okay, well, so I don't think Rick would be too pissed off if I said that he was an enthusiast of certain powders. Um, he liked them. He had them around. Uh, and it was known that he knew where to get them. So this guy, Brian, uh, asked him, oh, hey, uh, you know, I'm a trust fund kid, and I'm looking to live on the edge. Oh, uh, no. I would like to uh, maybe purchase some of these powders. And so Rick, after knowing the guy for a year, is like, okay, I'll give you a phone number. Like, I can't. I don't do that sort of quantity. So here you go. Passed him off. And the guy, like, met the new dealer and then moved up the chain and then moved up the chain again to the point where he was about to buy, like, pounds of drugs from Hondurans that had nothing to do with me or my friends. <laughs> like, these were dealers of dealers of dealers. And so... At a, Good rationalization, Xena. <laughs> you know where drugs come from, right? <laughs> that's everyone that does drugs has mm -hmm. to do that. That's not just me, okay? <laughs> now I get it. Dealing with the Hondurans, <clears throat> asshole. So, part of the deal was uh, they were going to sell him a car that was tricked out with, like, secret compartments mm -hmm. and pounds of cocaine and pounds of meth. 
and this undercover. Well, that's your problem. This undercover <laughs> Brian <laughs> comes to my friend Rick Fucking and says, Brian. Uh, "I'm I'm just a scared kid. I'm in over my head." Could you, uh, I don't know, show up and uh, maybe have my back when I go do this crazy thing? Um, I'll give you $500 if you just show up and just, I don't know, you're tall and menacing. And Rick is like, uh, Like $500 tonight? <laughs> uh, yeah, in the next couple days. And Rick is All like, right. well, I'm short on rent, but I'm only short like 200 so don't even worry about it. Give me the 200 Like, Rick talks him down. <laughs> because he's a friend. I mean, like, I don't... It, oh, it's what a nice fine. Rick. He is a very nice guy. Hmm. He stands up for his friends. Um, so I'd like to think also, I'm a nice Rick, too. <laughs> now, let's make this more about me. Okay. It's team. it's Rick and Damien. So, uh, the guy's <laughs> so like... So, I guess I'll... This, this drug deal is going to go down in this parking lot. Please show up at 4 p.m. Rick, uh, being a friend of mine, this is a uh, fuck-up, uh, doesn't show up on time. <laughs> He's like kind of getting his shit together at his house at four. And it's like, ah, I, yeah, okay, whatever. He like shows up at like twenty after after the uh, cops had already swarmed the whole deal and arrested the Hondurans trying to sell the pounds of cocaine and meth. And uh, but because Rick's car drove by, uh-huh. uh, Brian points at it and says, "Oh, hey, get that guy too." And so they arrest him. He wasn't even at the drug deal, <sighs> but. Get this, he had a handgun in his trunk they had got from a police auction. So he had a stamped Seattle Police Department handgun in his trunk. And because of that, he had multiplied charges. That He was looking at 40 years. The Hondurans that were selling pounds of coke and meth were looking at 10 years. So there's this thing that prosecutors do where if you don't have a gun but you pretend to have a gun when you're doing a crime, that fear <coughs> mm-hmm. multiplies your charge into yeah. you having a gun. Yeah. No one was afraid of this guy. <laughs> Not at all. It's, he wasn't even there. It's ridiculous. It's as ridiculous as cops getting to shoot you because they're like, well, I was scared. Yeah, well, and cops are trained to be whiny little pussies. <laughs> they're just like, oh, everyone's going to shoot at you, and you're important, little I've warrior. I've been stabbed. No, no everyone's going to come I've after been attacked you. with glass. Like, granted, they were just kids, but they were big, strong, scary kids. Um, but nobody let me know at any scared. point that I could shoot them. Um, I was just taught to, like, redirect force and, like, be able to take people down to the ground. Yeah. And Calm the situation. And divert. I'm sorry. Like, at no point when, even before that, like, when I was growing up in the country and some asshole would, like, attack me with a length of wood because, like, there's crazy assholes in the country. Mm-hmm. Um like shooting. Mm-hmm. Shooting's not a response to things. No. No, it's not. <laughs> yelling, sometimes. Yelling is a response. Oh, yelling has worked for me so many times, including, like, having airport security, like, converge on me in an airport mm. because they're calling my name to go to, like, ticketing, and I'm standing in front of ticketing, and no one's there, and I was just like, help! <laughs> and holy shit. Um, security guy ran at me screaming like, I'll show you fucking help. <laughs> That's cute. It was terrifying. Yeah, I bet. That, yeah, like he didn't pull his gun on me, but he had his hand on the butt of his oh, gun the whole time. they always had their hand on their gun. Right? Mm-hmm. Because they know that they are the precious few that stand between chaos and order, and if they go down, then the entire world burns, so they have to defend themselves. And if someone even, like, pokes them a little bit, then everyone else is going to die. What's a non-misogynist way of saying sissy? Rick gets arrested, and they he's been an anarchist all his life. He was the lead singer of Chikung, very anarchist band. They had t-shirts that had a step-by-step process of how to make a Molotov cocktail. It's not hard. They went to Burning Man and had a Molotov cocktail range with uh, I remember targets. You had that shirt. No. No? I wish I did. I remember seeing that design then. Or yeah, it was around. Yeah, there's like figure one, figure two, figure three. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, and then they like toured the world, uh, you know, fighting fascism and, and authoritarianism. And um, so they're, they've been kind of gunning for him for a while. And, but they didn't know that he actually came from a certain sort of money. 
which is Oklahoma trucker cap money. And I don't know yeah. if you bought Oklahoma <laughs> and trucker caps, but man, Oklahoma likes its trucker caps. Um, so, so his our, family had oh, money. Oh, like trucker yeah. caps, like, like trucker the, caps. the styrofoam like hats? Yeah, John Deere. Just those are the forget. worst. Like when those mm -hmm. went into vogue in the 2000s. Mm -hmm. um, oh, it was awesome. Yeah. Oh, I had like five. I, mm -hmm. I was from a place where like the scummiest of the scumbags wore those hats, and they wore those hats because those were the cheapest promotional hats mm -hmm. that like you could like Uline or whatever company like make shit for God, companies to sell. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah, that's what you say, but you were mm -hmm. sitting at an amazing Uline picnic table right now. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> cheapest wood on... Well, no. The second cheapest wood online. That's... What? What? <laughs> okay. I didn't know you could get wood online. That's weird. Oh, dude. I get hard, like, over tons of things. Uh, wait. Are we talking about Pornhub again? Yes. Okay. Is that uh, shark? Uh, you get wood over tons of things? Uh, you got wood online. Oh. <sighs> anyway. I'm sorry. He's not. I am. That's a part of what gets me there. Um, <laughs> where are we at? Uh, so, uh, you're Rick in prison. Rick is arrested, um, but they don't know he has money, and they're like, you're looking at 40 years. Just uh, admit that you're this huge uh, drug kingpin. And he says, no. And his lawyer comes in and says, uh, <laughs> don't even say no, motherfucker. His lawyer comes in and is like, uh, what the fuck is all this? Uh, this is entirely entrapment. Uh, you spent $6 million dollars. Uh, trying to make an illegal establishment so you could like, <laughs> arrest people that did it with your money. Lawyers uh, are so fucking no. smart slash evil sometimes. And so I wanted to be a lawyer for. A I, I've had time. such good lawyers. Oh, man. So they're like, well, he did all this. He did all this really bad stuff, and his lawyers like, that doesn't matter. Inadmissible. You look like a fool. So here's what we're gonna do. Um, instead of the forty years that you're. Uh, facing him with, we're going to do 40 months tops. And he's going to admit to running guns to the Zapatista rebels in Mexico. Whew. <laughs> <laughs> Which, wait, 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 wait. wait. Yes. If anyone doesn't know geography, <laughs> Seattle is literally as far away as you can get from Mexico in the continental United States. Um, but and he, I'm not sure whether Alaska is farther away from Mexico than Hawaii, but still, Seattle is really far away mm -hmm. from Mexico. So, this is something that Rick pled guilty to. Ah, oh, poor motherfucker. No, no. He was proud of it. He was out on bail, and he took his papers to bars and got shots for running guns to anarchist rebels in Mexico. And if you don't know about the Chiapas Rebellion, the Zapatistas, you should look it up. Because it's fucking awesome. Um, if you would like to uh, book the deck stage say, yeah. at the House of Hooks and Nails, get in touch with me it's in at, Oakland. at A3RD underscore D-A-Y on the Twitter. And we'll talk about you doing a renegade show in my fucking backyard. Um, I built a 30-foot wide stage, um, and um, my friends who are doing my electrical work and yeah, uh, staying totally at my house. Yeah, it totally has power. Um, we will have power in the future, um, but they, they just brought an 11-foot wide movie screen. Um, and the way to engender um, love in your neighbors for having an illegal stage is to show free movies for the kids in the neighborhood. Sure. <coughs> And then, like, charge them 20 bucks, like, for a little cup okay, of popcorn. no more illegal establishments. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's my bread and butter. Wait. That's my air. The, the thing that. is, like... I'm kidding. I haven't even... You, never mind. I, I endorse this. Thank you. I endorse um, illegal... No, it's weird. Like... Yeah. I hear you're not done with you. No, no. I was going to see if you were wrapped up on the thing. So, uh, I don't know. Rick went to prison. Mm -hmm. He's very happy about it, but he only went for uh, three years. Let's say 40. Uh, and then I saw him after he got out. He's a nice guy. He's good. He's, uh, God, he's three years is such a long time. It's a very long time for, for federal something. prison, yes. For, uh, for running a party with uh, just like cards and kind of and, and <sighs> chicks, so with, fucking with stupid. chicks with nipples uh, yeah there's absolutely no reason for it and uh, the money that was spent on it 
was it's puritanical dumb. shit. Um, besides mm. the fact like, that literally like, like over six million dollars, people have like done the math on it. So that's insane. So I don't know if people realize how much money six hundred thousand dollars is. Um, I have worked six for million. nonprofit six. What million. did I say? You said six hundred thousand. <laughs> oh well, that no, is no, this was six okay. million. <laughs> okay, like okay. based on the SWAT team that showed up to my buddy's house and like put a machine gun to the back of my blind friend's head. Right. During a game. Joe, who is a lovely, sensitive, uh, like, brilliant, artistic man. Mm -hmm. Um, Blind sushi chef, I've heard. Yeah, they they had too many cops to actually fit into Rick's house. So... So They had to wait outside with their guns and take turns coming in. I've been working for nonprofits most of my life. Um, I have worked for, uh, like, medium-sized nonprofits and small nonprofits. Large nonprofits are like Kaiser, um, which is, is the... Non-profit? Kaiser Permanente is the largest nonprofit oh, in the world. Ah, yeah. Okay. Um, hmm. Oh, uh, we, we can talk about 501. Like, that's, that's what I've got my goddamn master's degree in. Oh, sure. um, if we want to talk about nonprofits, I will have sure. my friend in here with the same degree as me, and we will be assholes and talk about how, like... Support nonprofits, but like understand that nonprofits are, are a different. bullshit patch mm-hmm. on like society banding together and having the government take care yeah, of Yeah, which them. is why Burning Man turning into a nonprofit means nothing and actually means something terrible. Uh, that's not entirely we're true not, either. This isn't a Burning um, Man podcast. It, Wait, it's we're not, not talking about that. Um, <laughs> there, are, there are so many more controls mm-hmm. on nonprofit corporations than there are on for profit corporations. But um, we were talking about something else. And my ADD refuses to tell me what that is. If you didn't have any parents, like, I wish I was there. We hope you're To help great. raise you in whatever uh, orphanage or, uh, yeah, like, group home creepy. you <laughs> grew up in. Um, oh, and, uh, Zeno, we... I wish I was there to hug you when you were, like, 10 to 12 and you really needed my hug. No, if I had needed a hug and got it, I wouldn't have done all the things that I did. I get it. So, fuck off. Yeah, I fair. your stupid hug. Mm. Uh, thank you. I appreciate the sentiment. Yeah, I got too many hugs. That's why I didn't do anything. Wait, what's the homework? Oh, um, what's the homework? Uh, oh, if you do don't a know, bit of crime, but don't get caught. Yeah. Or think about crime. Uh, think about. Ooh. So try to steal something using a self checkout. No, 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 no. We, we, we. You can't promote stealing. Um, what you well, can promote wait, doing is. No, 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 no. Yeah, don't steal avocados. Um, what you want to do is is you want to see some sort of sign. Um, so just the way that like we've been conditioned and maybe how our brains work is like we understand hierarchy. We understand when like someone in authority tells us something. You understand. And when people put up official looking signs or messages, we just assume that those are the same sort of thing as traffic signs. Um, and we assume that, like, there is some sort of authority behind them. So you can put up any um, sign you want. Exactly. Sorry. Um, feel Just free to it. make a sign, find uh, some place to laminate the sign, or do something that makes it look official. Even and if you fe- could get, like, a chunk of, like, metal, mm-hmm. you put some money in it. Man, people will believe that sign. Uh, I I have a great sign on uh, the stairs from uh, my first floor going down into my basement, which also doesn't have any power, um, which is like a uh, New York-style subway sign that I designed that uh, tells you where the bathroom is and where like the studio and the garage is and where the existential terror is. Um, I thought that was everywhere. 